I want to say good morning. Um, hopefully you'll be streaming and watching here, for those of you that are at home. Uh, the first song we're singing is To God Be the Glory. Well, once again, again, it is good to be in God's house. We love each and every one of you so much. We miss you so much. And just continue to be praying, and it'll be a short time before we're all back together uh, again. Listen, uh, Brother Jim, the deacons, we all met last week, and we're going to do that each Thursday. Is everything we're doing the right thing? I have no idea. But you just continue praying for the church, Praying for the deacons, praying for Brother Jim, and we'll all get through this together as a loving church family. But we love and miss each and every one of you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of life, God. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your protection. And God, we just invite you, the Holy, sweet Holy Spirit, into this service and give Brother Jim just a special anointing as the word goes out. And we thank you for the word. We thank you for the Bible, God, so much. We pray that lives are changed this morning. And God, we just praise your holy name as your sweet spirit fills this place. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.
All right, the next song we're singing is It Is Well. Well with my soul. What a beautiful song. We have several prayer concerns this morning. Uh, first, we want to uh, remember the Clark family in prayer, uh, Buff Clark and his family. We also want to remember uh, uh, the Roberts family, or uh, yeah, Sister Debbie and uh, her family. Also remember Herschel and Janice Miller, their neighbors to uh, Brother Jerry and Sharon. Remember Gary and Gail Blevins. Uh, continue praying for Sister Rhonda. Uh, she is home now. She's doing better. She's wanting to come to church. 
so she can uh, sing a special. So just continue praying for uh, Sister Rhonda. Remember Sharon Dyer's family, her brother Jay has some surgery coming up. Coming up. Remember Mike and Todd and Cash and Chloe. Also remember Sister Joe Virgin. We want to remember her in prayer. Uh, just a faithful member here for years. Remember Ashley Deskins and also uh, Sister Kim and Zella. Remember them this morning. Uh, Brother Junior, Sister Lucille, Brother Earl, Bill and Reba, my Brother Dave and Sister Sharon. And we want to continue to pray for our school kids, our country, our president, and our church, and all those that are uh, affected by the virus. So I'm going to ask Brother Jim if he'll word a prayer for all of our sick. Father and our God, we're so grateful for another day you've given us, Father, and we thank you for the privilege we have of lifting these up in prayer. We know that you're mindful of each and every one. But Father, we just ask a special blessing upon each of them today. Father, for those who have lost loved ones, we just pray that you would comfort them and give them the peace that only you can give. But Father, right now, we just ask you to pray for those that are going through a very difficult time. Many are sick, Father. Many are going through a tough time with the virus. Many are going through a tough time with just other ailments. But Father, we just thank you for the fact that you're mindful of each and every one. Father, we, we ask, lift up our church family to you. We miss mm. them so very much. Father, yes. we want them to be back here. Bless them. And Father, we're looking for the time that we can all together again as God's family, as we gather here in God's house each and every week, Father. We just pray that you comfort us as we go through these difficult times. And Father, just bless us as we wait for that time that we can all be together. Father, we just pray for the message this morning. It's your message, and we would pray that, Father, We'll find lodging in the hearts of those that need to hear. And Father, we just pray for the you, uh, just a touch from you in each and every heart today. Father, again, thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for the privilege of delivering your message. Father, you're a loving God, and we just love you, and we praise you. We ask you to watch over us throughout this day and throughout this service. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, the song I want to sing is I Want to Know More About My Lord. <clears throat>
promised when his soul ascended. I'm coming back, the Lord did say, if on his promise he depended. On wings of love, you'll soar away. I want to know more about my Jesus. know more about that homeland. Amen. Everybody take your Bibles, please, and lift them up. And repeat after me. Come on, Dan, lift it up, even though Dan's not here. <laughs> Hold my hand, the very Word of God. Every word is absolutely true. Where my life differs from this book, it will gladly change with God's help. Amen. Brother Jim. Well, I pray that it is good with you physically, but I also pray more importantly, it's better with your soul. It's good with your soul, and one of these days we will go home. Go home to be with the Lord. Brother Dave said it, I've said it, but we miss you folks. Uh, and hopefully uh, we can get this virus a little bit farther behind us so we can uh, get back together as God's family again in God's house. You know, there's a renewed interest today in storytelling because everybody loves a good story. We just love stories. And uh, I think one of the reasons that is true is because we have learned that telling stories and using illustrations and drawing verbal pictures help us to understand better the message that is being taught. The neurophysiologists have found that we're not only left-brained, but we're right-brained as well. I, I, that makes us good. we got a whole brain. I guess that's good. But the left brain is where we get language and concepts. The right brain is where we, where we get pictures and where illustrations and stories bring what we learn more into impact. The Lord Jesus Christ is far ahead of all of us because he, he's the one that designed us. He's the one that created us. And so Jesus was very good to teach the truth, but he would illustrate the truth in many, many different ways. Sometimes he would use illustrations from the world events that was going on. He would also use nature as well. He would talk about the birds and he would point to birds that were flying in the air. And he, by the point that he was making is just as a heavenly father takes care of the birds that are flying in the air, how much better will he take care of you? He would talk about each of those. He would pick up a little seed and he said, you know, the, the farmer takes the seed, he goes out and he sows it in the ground and in a little while he brings forth a crop. But that's exactly what the Bible is. The Bible is a seed for us. The Bible is a word of God for us. And when we do that, when we plant that in our hearts, when we do that, it brings forth a crop. It is a crop of love, it is a crop of peace, it is a crop of goodwill, it is a crop of loving our fellow man. So Jesus was a storyteller. Sometimes he told stories from the world of nature, but sometimes he would tell stories from current events. Jesus would take some truth that he wanted to teach people, and he'd lay an earthly story uh, to, as an illustration alongside of it. He would take what people knew and he would paint a picture. And in order to illustrate and explain the, some, the truth that he was trying to do, but it always came back to a spiritual realm. From current events, Jesus would talk about things and tell stories, and they would teach people about the meaning of sin, tell people about what it is to be saved, about salvation, talk to them about what heaven was all about, and all of the wonderful truths of what it means to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what our scripture is this morning. It's all about, if you have your Bibles, if you're at home, take your Bible. If you want to stand with us there, please do so. But we're in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. 
This is a very familiar parable. It is a parable of the Good Samaritan. But let's read what God's Word says. Beginning in verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and testing him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law, and what is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and set him on his animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the truths of your word. Father, there's a message for us here. Help us to have ears to hear and hearts of understanding this morning. And Father, we'll give you the praise for what you do in each, and heart, each heart and life this day. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. This particular story is a parable that could very well come out of the newspaper headlines that we have today. It could have been a headline. The headline would have probably said this, mugging on the highway. And that's exactly what happened here, mugging on the highway. That's what, how we would put it today. It's a story that is very current that we could see today. It is a story of hate. It is also a story of, of racial prejudice. It is a story of ind indifference, if you will. But it's also is a story uh, of, of unusual compassion. The Lord Jesus told it about his day. And we can use it today to explain exactly the life, what life is all about, what's going on in our world today. And when Jesus told the story, you know, he never told a story just to be telling a story. He always had a spiritual lesson for us there. Sometimes would, Jesus would tell a story to answer a question. He would always tell a story in order to illustrate some truth. And when you're looking at the stories Jesus told, you have to look at what comes before. You also have to look at what comes after to get a total message of what Jesus is saying. And that is true of the story Jesus told about the Samaritan. There was a lawyer, verse 25 tells us, who, who came up to Jesus. Now that's not a lawyer that we think of lawyers today. This person was an expert, if you will, in the Old Testament law. He knew the Bible. He knew the Old Testament. He knew everything about it. He knew every law that was there and believed there were many, many laws that they had to take and many understood, and he understood them all. He was an expert in it, and he could take the truth of the Bible. He could take the truth of those laws and try to apply them to everyday life. So a lawyer in that sense was an expert in the Old Testament law. This expert in the Bible came to the Lord Jesus and asked him a question. That question very simply is, what shall I do to be saved? How can I inherit eternal life? Now, there could be no greater question than any of us could ever ask today. What do I do to inherit eternal life? What do I do to be saved? And that's going to be everywhere that people come today. People need to ask questions. People have a lot of questions, but there's no greater question about eternity and about what's going to happen at the end of this life that we have. So it's a very important question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus did what he often did in these circumstances. He took a question and responded with a question. And Jesus was very good at this, and uh, he, he did that. And Jesus looked at that expert in the law, and he said to him, what is written in the law? But not only did he ask him what's written in the law, but he asked him, how do you interpret what's written in the law? Now, it's, it's okay to ask somebody a question, but boy, if you try to get down to the meaning of it, that's exactly what Jesus was doing here. The man immediately knew the answer to the question. He knew that from Deuteronomy chapter 6, he knew that from Levit Leviticus chapter 19, it says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and every vestige in you. But he also says the second part of that is to love your neighbor as yourself. This guy knew it. He knew it frontwards. He knew it backwards. He knew everything, and that was exactly what the law said to do. Then Jesus said to him in verse 28, you have answered right. Man, he got 100 on that test. He did everything right. 
But then he said, do this and you will live. Now, that, that brought it down a little bit. Now, I'm kind of reading between the lines right now, and I, I have a feeling of when Jesus said that, it hit this man like a ton of bricks because he, did not, he knew that he could not do what the law said. He knew that. He was totally unprepared for Jesus. But Jesus said, do this and you will live. You know, that's the problem right there. That's the problem this man had. But folks, let me tell you, that's the problem that you and I have as well. We cannot keep the law. We cannot do that. that that's the requirements of the law. That's why we can't be saved by keeping the law. The law says do this and live. But the problem is we can't do it. We can't do everything that's in the law. We can't keep the Ten Commandments. We can't keep the Golden Rule. We can't do anything like that. Now, we try, and we can keep most of it, but we can't keep all of them all the time. So we can't live this way. We can't love the Lord the way we ought to love the Lord. We can't love our neighbors the way we ought to love our neighbors as well. The law demands to do this and live. Grace, on the other hand, says get, live and then do. The law demand, what the law demands of us, the Lord Jesus Christ produces in us. He produces that grace that allows us to live the Christian life, to live the life that he wants us to live. Then it says in verse 29 that this man wanted to justify himself. That meant he wanted to clear his conscience. He wanted to clear himself of, of, of the charges of sin against him. Now, I, this is just my idea. I believe he might have been under conviction at that time. I don't know, but perhaps he probably was. But let me tell you what he should have done. He should have confessed his sins to Jesus right there. He should have got on his knees and asked God to forgive him. He should have done what every one of us ought to do when we and I face the demands of the law. We need to come under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to allow him to come into our hearts and lives. And when we do that, when we see what the Bible requires, requires of us, we need to confess that we can't do everything the Bible tells us to do. It, the, the fact that, that we're not able to keep the law. We're not able to live the way the Bible commands us to live. We're not able to do that, but we're to call on our God for mercy and grace and invite Jesus into our hearts, and that's when we get the feeling of love, peace, and everything that comes on in it. Jesus is the answer to all of our problems. I read a long time ago, it doesn't matter what the question is, Jesus is the answer. And I remember if it was Billy Graham that said Christ is the answer, do you remember that little pamphlet he had? Folks, that is exactly right. The man is looking for a loophole. He's looking for some way out. He's trying to wiggle out of the fix that he's in, so to speak, if you will, the situation he's in. So ask the Lord another question. Man, if you don't know the answer to a question, you can't do it. Just ask another question. He said, okay, then who's my neighbor? Well, it was in response to this question right here that the Lord Jesus, that he hears from the lawyer, Jesus tells us to be, to me, one of the most fascinating, one of the most interesting stories he ever told. That's what I would call it, the mugging on the highway. When Jesus told this story that's familiar to us, it was also familiar to the area in which they lived as well, the story of the Good Samaritan. He shows us how people relate to other people. He shows us three categories of people in the world today and on the basis of how they relate to other people. First of all, there are people who abuse other people. They're abusive people. The story begins in verse 30 with a scene that would be familiar with them in that area at that time. And it, we had understand it said, said a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now understand that is about a 17 mile journey. It's a drop of about 3,300 feet in elevation to get from Jerusalem down to Jericho. The roads are very narrow. It is a very rocky place. There are a lot of places to hide in those little corners that are around there. It is very rocky, it's very abandoned. It is a very dangerous, dangerous place for anyone to go. <clears throat> but also, if you look back at the time in which this was, uh, it was especially dangerous because Herod had laid off some 40,000 te temple workers, temple people, and they didn't have anything else to do. And one commentator said that they went down and they began to rob people. It's the only way they could make, make a living. It's the only way they could survive themselves. But it was so bad, so dangerous, that that road itself, the Jericho Road, became known as the Bloody Way. Now, you and I are aware of the fact, I'm sure, that we're living in a dangerous society today. Things aren't always peachy keen and all that. There's danger and there's trouble in the world today. Danger rides along beside us every time we get in an automobile and go down the road. Danger waits us at the shopping areas. It waits us in the parking lots. Here's a man who is probably a Jewish businessman by all counts, and he's unnamed. But he goes on a short journey, goes on a business trip, he's going back home, and he almost loses his life. Well, here's a man going down that old Jericho road, and the Bible says he falls among thieves. They stripped him of his clothing. They wounded him. I believe they beat him unmercifully, and they departed, leaving him half dead. 
Now, that's a very gruesome picture. That's a bad picture when we think about it. But that illustrates the attitude of some people today. Some people today, even today, have an attitude like that toward other people in the world. There are some people who abuse other people. Some are living, we're living in a society right now that has become dehumanized. We have a generation of people that have been brought up to believe that human life is not worth anything anymore. You just look, you don't have to watch the news very much anymore. The riots that are going on, everything that's going on. So they look, look on other people, not as people to be loved, not as people to be, be helped, but rather things to be used and abused. And that's exactly what they do. You know, there are all kinds of abuses going on around us today. There's the robber that is out there. He will take things that do not belong to him. There's also the crooked businessman out there that will rob you every time you go in the store. He abuses people. Think about parents who abuse their children. Think about that. That is a travesty of itself. Think about the parent who uses alcohol, beats up his wife, and also abuses his little children. We just can't imagine that in America today. But folks, that's happening in America. If you read the newspaper, it's happening in our area. We don't have to look very far to see abuses like that going on. You see, there's also a thing of parental abuse, children abusing their children, or uh, children abusing their parents. Children can abuse their parents as well. But it's wonderful to know that Jesus, every time Jesus dealt with people, they were better off when they left him than they were when they got there. You see, there are a lot of people in this world, and all they do is abuse people. They just beat people up, whether physically, whether verbally, or emotionally. All abuse is not physical. Many times it's verbal, many times it's emotional. But if you notice here, this man is not responsible for the treatment that he receives. He's done nothing to warrant being beat up, robbed, and, and his clothing taken from him, if you will. But you know, some people say that every time somebody's something goes wrong, they'll say, well, what sin did they commit? What is their problem? Well, folks, let me tell you, there are some folks in this world who have not sinned, but rather they have been sinned against so here is a picture of those who abuse other people. Was there a spiritual lesson here? Absolutely there is. The Bible says that what Satan and sin will do to you, look what Jesus said in John 10.10. 10. You know, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture. A lot of times we read the last part, Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and they have it more abundantly. But the first part of that simply says this, the thief, talking about Satan, cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the first part of that 10th verse of that 10th chapter of John. Sometimes we don't ever read that. We just like the part where Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give, live it more abundantly. So in this story, Jesus tells us, first of all, those who abuse other people. These are the takers in life. They say this, what, you, what, what yours is mine and I will take it. I believe at this time Jesus had their attention. Everybody, everybody is at attention because danger and abuse and victimization are something that we're all familiar with. Well, as the story of the Good Samaritan continues, the next character appears in verse 21. It is a priest. Now, second we see, if you will, those who avoid people. The priest is on his way and he sees this man on the side of the road who has been beaten up and left half dead. It says when the priest saw him, he moves to the other side. Now I want to bring this up to date. I'm going to tell you, this is a preacher that's walking by. I can talk about us. I can talk about us, if you will. So when we think about that, in those days, a priest was a person who, in all probability, had been up to the temple to serve in the temple, and he is on his royal, on his royal robes, if he has those on, he's on his way back to Jericho. It is said there, to, there are about 12,000 priests in Jericho, and they would take turns going up to Jerusalem to go into the temple and serve in the temple there. That's exactly in all probability what this priest had done. He had done that. And when we think about that, we understand that, that he's done his duties for the Lord. He's been up to the temple. He's served there. But now he's going back home, back to Jericho. He's on his way from church, and he's been preaching. Maybe, maybe we think about that. If we're calling him a preacher, maybe he's preached a powerful, powerful sermon on, on loving the Lord. But he comes along, and here's a guy who is near dead, next to dead. Here's a guy on a desolate road. Very few people come along. And I can almost imagine what he said. Poor guy. Man, I'm sure glad this didn't happen to me. I'm glad I'm okay. I'm glad everything is okay. I hope somebody will come along and help this poor soul. I can't do it. You know, I'm a preacher. I'm not a paramedic. So the Bible says that he moves to the other side of the road to get around him. Well, a little while, verse 32, here comes another guy down the road. He's a Levite. We're going to call him a deacon. 
he comes along tooling down the road. He's on his way down to Jericho because he has a speaking engagement. He's going down to the Jerusalem Social Concern Society on how to love your neighbor. And that's what he's going to do. He looks over there and here's this poor guy laying over there. He's all beat up. He needs somebody to help him. He said, poor fella, I guess I could help him. But I'm not a paramedic. I don't know what I could do. Anyway, he's only one person. I'm going down and speak to hundreds of people. I'm going to help a lot of people. I, I, I just hope somebody else comes along. Now, these two guys have been to church. Man, there's nothing wrong with going to church. Here's a preacher. Here's a deacon. There is no compassion in them whatsoever. It seems they have no love in their hearts for this poor guy. Well, let me ask you this. What happens when you and I go to church? When we go to church, what, what happens? We sing wonderful songs together. We hear the word of God. We study the word of God. We worship together. We praise God together. But does anything else happen? What happens when we leave here? Does any take place in our hearts and changes our attitude and our outlook toward other people? Folks, I pray that it does. What's the philosophy of these two guys? Their philosophy is their philosophy of those who want to avoid other people. And I am sure they had a lot of excuses they could have used. They could have probably said, you know, we've been gone from home a long time. I've got to wait and get home and get my kids. I, I can't be held up at all. I, I can't do that. I'm sure I don't know how to help this guy. I'm sure that I'm not a paramedic. I'm sure I could probably get blood on my hands and all that. So I'll just go my way. Well, folks, these aren't bad people. I don't believe they're bad people. I believe they're good guys. They are just busy. They are just busy. There are a lot of people who aren't bad, but they're just too busy to do what God calls them to do. And we have to be careful of that. They got a lot going on. Now, one of the things that's happening in American society today, people don't want to get involved. They just don't want to get involved. We have a tendency nowadays to retreat to our own homes. We want to sit there and we don't want to be bothered anymore. Two greatest problems in America are ignorance and indifference. And there's a lot of that that's causing people problems. You know, God made us to relate to other people. That's what's so devastating to me about this virus. We're not relating to other people. We're not, we're not, not able to do what we do here, and that's hug. We do that. We're huggers. And we're a hugger church. Maybe we can put the name out there, the hugging church. I know that. And there won't be anything wrong with that because that's what we do. Uh, somebody said, well, y'all wear masks. I said, well, some over here wear masks, some of them over here don't wear masks. Well, when it's over, they congregate in the middle. You know, I don't understand all that. But, we, you know, we do what we try to do. And that's exactly what we try to do. But God made us in a way that we want to be around other people. We want to love other people. We want other people to be around us. And, and that's the joy. That's the Christian fellowship that we can share one with another. And again, that's one of the devastating parts of this virus. God made you to relate to other people. God built you in such a way that you need other people. You cannot isolate yourself from other people. But the philosophy of many is to avoid other people, not get involved with other people. Like I said, I realize this virus has caused us to be with and helping other people is very, very difficult, if not almost impossible. But folks, it's not always going to be this way. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. And I pray soon. I pray soon. But you know, you can still help other people. You know where you sit in church. Look in front of you, look behind you, look to your right, look to your left. I think you probably know them. You probably do. And if you don't, you ought to get to know them. Get to know them. Make a phone call. Ask them how they're doing. Tell them you miss them. Tell them you love them. And don't tell them that if you don't, but I hope you do miss them. I hope you do love them. Just be sure that other people know that they're not forgotten. We're doing the best that we can, but we can't reach out to everybody. You all can get to touch people that we, we just can't get to. Well, there's a spiritual application here, too. The spiritual application is very simply this. It can't do anything in the world for you. Religion can't. All religion can do is take you through a ceremony, take you through forms, take you through formality, and make you feel bad. Make you feel bad. But it can do nothing to help you. These two men were religious. But they didn't do anything for this poor man. The religion didn't help this man. Religion can't do anything for us. What people need is salvation. They need Jesus, not religion. By this time, folks are really having a good time because everybody likes it when the preachers and the deacons are the bad guys. Well, the priest and Levi were bad guys. Now, Jesus throws them a curve, and they're not ready for this one. But I love verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, now remember, he's talking to Jews. He's talking to the Jews. The minute Jews brought up this terminology, terminology, a Samaritan, I can almost hear the people taking a very deep breath. 
Where's he going with this? Oh, me. Oh, me. Now, you know the Jews didn't have very good feelings about the Samaritans. What did they say? They wouldn't even go through the land. They didn't even want any relationship to do with them at all. So here in those days, the Jews are about to get a message. Now, you fill in the terminology about who's coming down the road. Because, folks, let me tell you, no one race has a corner on all the love. No one race has a corner of all the hate, all the prejudice, because it goes both ways. It's not the color of your skin. It's what's on the inside of your heart that really matters. That's all God cares about. He doesn't care what's over the outside of the door. He wants to know what's on your heart. That's exactly what he's wanting to do. So here's a Samaritan, and the Bible says a Samaritan comes along and sees this man in the condition that he's in. Now I want you to see the philosophy of the Samaritan. There are those who abuse people. Their philosophy is what yours is mine, and I'll take it. There are those who avoid people. They just don't want to get involved with people. They're, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. Then the praise, praise God, the Lord says, lastly, there are those who assist people. Their philosophy is, what's mine is mine, but I'll share it. I'll share it. Sharing what we have. Verse 31 says, and by chance there came down. The word means by coincidence, there came down. From an earthly perspective, there are circumstances that go on. There are coincidences that come along. But I believe God arranges the circumstances of our lives to get people to where he needs them to be. To get people in contact with the people that he needs to get them in contact with. It's not a coincidence that people are watching today. It's not a coincidence that I believe God allowed you to tune in today. So here's the man, the man philosophy who is what's mine is yours and I'll share it. He's going to assist this man. And as you look at this, there's a beautiful picture of what love is all about. Love is, it's, his love is in action. Here's love in action. Love is a compassion that feels. Love is there. Verse 33, he says, come to the man, he saw him and had compassion. You know, that's a word that is used very beautifully. Sometimes the Bible would see multitudes of people. He would have compassion on them. Think about the time he saw the multitudes gathered around and had them set on the hillside. It says that they had not eaten, but he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them. Well, when we think about that, it means to be deeply moved. Deeply moved of people. It means for your heart to go out to someone else. Love is a compassion that feels. Do we have any feeling for people today? Do we have any feeling for people for that? You know, I, th I think about our church. We're in a city where there are, I'm sure, hundreds and hundreds of lost people that are out there. What's our compassion for them? What do we do? Well, we think, is our heart moved for these people? God help us not to just go through the motions of the love of church, but to have a heart that really reaches out to other people and feels for them, one that makes contact. Verse 34 says he went to this man and he bound his wounds. He had to get his hands dirty, if you will. He had to do that. Now most of us want love by long distance when it comes to something like this. We want somebody else to go to the loving for us. We want somebody else to do the ministry for us. Let the deacons, let the preacher do that. And folks, let me tell you, as deacons and preachers, we got to do it. We must do it. We can't stand idle. But I believe he wants all of his children to get involved in helping other people. Love is a compassion that feels, and that's exactly what he has for us today. Love is also a care that helps. He went down to where the man was, he poured oil and wine. Those were the two antibiotics of that time. Uh, the oil was to soothe and the wine was to cleanse. He's getting personally involved with this man. He took care of him. Put him on his own animal, carried him to the inn, left two days of wages and had to take care of him. And when I get back, if it's cost any more, I will pay the price. I will take care of it. Folks, that's love. Love is compassion that feels. Love is a care that helps. Love is a commitment that endures. He said, I'm going to come back and I am committed to this situation. Spiritually, this is a very beautiful picture of what Jesus did for us. You and I couldn't go to where Jesus was, so he came to us. He left heaven and he came to where we were. We were helpless. We were beaten spiritually. We were bruised. We were half dead by sin. And Jesus come and paid the price that we could not pay for ourselves. He did that by shedding his blood. He did that at Calvary. Jesus put us into his family. I love the song we sing. I'm a part of the family of God. I love that song. 
He rescued us from our sins. And he says, one of these days, one of these days I'm coming back. When I come back, I'm going to take you home with me. Jesus asked which of these was the neighbor. It was obvious. The story had, it was so plain. Nobody could miss it. The man said, he that showed mercy. He that showed mercy. Jesus gave him another opportunity. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and show mercy to those around you. Right there is where the gospel comes in. God's message this morning is about loving other people. God's message this morning is about helping other people. God's message this morning is how we ought not to abuse people, how we not to avoid, ought not to avoid people, and how we ought to assist people. But you see, the truth of the matter is that we look in our own hearts. And many times we're not capable of the kind of living that God wants us to do. When Jesus says, go and do likewise, we can't do it on our own. We've got to have him with us. He's got to have us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us do that. Admit that we don't have the kind of love for the Lord that we ought to have. I keep thinking back to that story when he asked Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me? He asked him three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you really, really love me? And I wonder if he asked me the same thing. Jim, do you love me? Well, Lord, you know I love you. Jim, do you, do you, do you love me? Well, Lord, you know I do. Jim, do you really love me? And that gets that hits home when you think about that. Oh, yes, we all love the Lord. We all say we love the Lord. But do we love him enough to do everything he's called us to do? That's what he's asking today. You see, it must be an awful thing for people to live with the kind of hate that so many live with today. So much prejudice in their hearts that they live with today. And folks, I'm sad to say we see that more in America today than any other time in my life. I've been around a long time. It must be a terrible way to live. But there's a better way to live, and that is a way of love. That's the way of Jesus. You can learn to, learn to live the way of love if you come to Jesus and let him make you a loving kind of person. The more we love Jesus, the more we're going to love other people. That's what's going to happen. And as a child of God, with Jesus as our Savior, we get closer to the Lord, loving him more and more and more each day, assisting other people more and more each day. Simple question this morning, how much do you love the Lord? Do you love him enough to allow him to become your Savior? You know, he is a Savior for all who will call upon his name. His name is Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, there's something about that name. There's something saving about that name. There's something saving about that name. There's a something about that name that will get you through the difficulties in life. And there's something about that name that will get us through the difficulties of this virus as well. His name is Jesus. Church family, let's love him more and more. To love other people more and more. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the love of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the love that he has shown upon each of us. He did that by going to Calvary's cross to pay for our sin debt, one that we could not pay on our own. Father, help us not to avoid others that are we consider different from us, others that, that need a helping hand. Help us, Father, to be those that will assist other people. Father, I just pray right now that as we take this time and for those that are listening today, watching today, if there's a need in their heart, I pray that they would turn that need over to you. If there's a need for salvation, they can do that right where they are. Just confess their sins and ask you to come in their heart and save them and vow to live the rest of your life for them. Father, I pray now for this time. Thank you for Jesus. We love you. We love him. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first, we thank God for the word that was brought to us, that he sent to us through Brother Jim. And uh, we just can't, uh, 
just can't love each other enough. We do have a few birthdays I want to recognize this week. Uh, I may have missed some, but I think I've got them all. Bill Clare, Jane Ashley, and Tyler Morris will be having birthdays this week. So we want to sing happy birthday. So are you ready? Impose. Come on, Jim. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. God bless you. Listen, let's do this. Since we will not be together this evening, Jim, let's just ask all of our church family. You can do it at home. At 6 o'clock, uh, everybody just take some time and, uh, uh, and have prayer. Have prayer for our, uh, our country, our school children, uh, our president, our church, for each other. So at 6 o'clock this evening, I'm asking everyone to just spend some time in prayer. Uh, call other church members and remind them to do this, okay? And to uh, go along with Brother Jim's a message, just continue to love each other, pray for each other, and treat each other good. Get down on your knees and just cry out to God. Pray for each other. God bless each and every one of you. We love you so very much. And it won't be long that we'll all be back together. So, Brother Mike, you want to close with the song? Yep. We want to sing the family of God. Oh, yeah. Let me get this. Oh, okay. I had that written down. Also, uh, John H. Smith had an aunt that passed away, and uh, uh, I had prayer with him a minute ago, Jim. We just need to pray for him and his family. There's nothing we can do. There'll be a service later uh, down the road, but just remember uh, Brother Johnny Smith and his family in prayer. Thank you, Jim. Mike. 